Hello students, this week we will be discussing Hi Susan. students, this week we will be discussing Suzanne Langer's A Note on Film, which is an excerpt from her 1953 book, Feeling and Form. So you're very familiar with The Wizard of Oz, I would assume, right? A Midwestern girl gets sucked into a tornado, turns up in a magical land, and then wakes up to realize it was all just a dream. So dreams get used a lot in movies. You're very used to um, dream sequences or a movie where you can't tell if you're in a dream or not or where the character wakes up and it turns out it was all a dream. This is a trope that is used a lot. We have a lot of sort of dream-like qualities in fantasy movies, especially by directors like Terry Gilliam. We're sort of entering in this fantastical dream-like space. We see a lot of use of dream in horror movies, um, right? We're very vulnerable when we're sleeping and we confront a lot of our worst fears in our dreams. And so something like A Nightmare on Elm Street makes a lot of sense as a horror movie. You have these teenagers who, when they fall asleep, are being attacked by this vicious murderer, for, uh, Freddy Krueger. I'm sure you're familiar with the plot. But um, we see dreams are used in horror movies to kind of heighten uh, that sort of tension and insecurity we feel in our sleep. This is a still from the dream sequence from Vertigo. We have this detective who's really plagued by guilt. He feels responsible for the deaths of two different people. Um, and so we see his inner life in this dream scene. We see the sort of um, guilt and fear that is inside of him. So a lot of times dreams are used to kind of give us this inside view of a character's sort of psychology, what's going through their mind. We also see this in Eternal Sunshine of a Spotless Mind. This movie deals with dreams and how they're related to memory, and particularly memory of loved ones and our past and the sort of emotional center of our memories. And of course, you're familiar with Inception. It's famous for having dreams within dreams within dreams and sort of playing with whether you're in a dream or not and not being sure about that. And a lot of times this movie kind of gets simplified because it's an action movie and it's very, um, the special effects are really cool. Um, but there's a lot more to this movie because Christopher Nolan is really, um, he is exploring the psychology of dreams and how dreams can be a healing process. They can be a way of confronting things um, that are painful to us, particularly trauma and guilt. So dreams and movies um, come together a lot, not just because movies deal with dreams, but because they have a lot of shared qualities. They both involve fantasy, they both involve memory, this relation to how we sort of process memory. Um, they have to do with our inner life. There's something just psychologically penetrating about a movie. And it's partly because movies like dreams have these intensified feelings, right? So movies always more dramatized. Everything is more intense emotionally in a movie. The same is true about dreams, right? There's frequently this emotional um, quality to dreams that um, a lot of stuff bubbles up in them that we might not have in our conscious waking life. We see a lot of desire and wish fulfillment in both dreams and movies, right? A lot of the reason why movies are so popular and people go to movies is we get to see these lifestyles that we don't necessarily get to live. Um, that we get to see these great romances or um, exotic places or interesting, inspirational lives. Um, and so we sort of see who we want to be when we go to the screen. We kind of project um, our desires onto the screen. We also see a lot of our fears and anxieties being presented in film, right? This is why horror movies and drama and suspense are so popular. There's something very uh, cathartic about confronting the things we're afraid of. And when they're on the screen, they're a little safe. So we get to process something from a distance. Um, the same thing goes for taboos and repressed desire. Um, there's a lot of sex and a lot of violence and torture and um, grotesque and painful things that we witness on the screen that we take pleasure in or we enjoy to some degree that we wouldn't necessarily want to have in our everyday lives. Um, and so it's not just about the fantasy, but it's about the exploration of taboos, the exploration of what we sort of repress. And when it's on the screen and made into sort of something cinematic, we can, again, confront it at a safe distance and feel safe from that thing that we are confronting. 
in dreams and in movies, there's a lot of blurring of the real and unreal. Um, so when you're asleep and you're dreaming, you think it is real, right? You kind of buy into the dream. In the same sense, when you're sitting in a movie theater or watching television and you're sucked into it, not when you're like on your phone, but when you're actually paying attention and really sucked into the movie, you feel as if it is real, right? In the same way that a dream is. And you can sort of wake within your dreams, um, and but then it loses the dreamlike quality. It becomes lucid, it becomes something different when you're aware that the dream is a dream. And the same thing with movies, you know, if you're really scared, sometimes you tell yourself, oh, it's just a movie, or you do something to kind of step back from buying into the movie. But there is something about seeing what is real in the unreal that happens in both movies and um, our dreams. And they also make the familiar unfamiliar, right? So a lot of times in your dreams, everyday objects, people very familiar to you reappear and they take on a different meaning, a different significance. They kind of like swapped roles or something different about them. And so you're like shifting the way you're thinking about your life while you're dreaming. And the same thing happens in movies, right? Things become more significant, more important. Things that you might overlook suddenly become very beautiful or interesting on a movie screen. And we also see these drawing of new connections that happen through films, sometimes impossible connections that are brought together. This can be a very um, popular storytelling device where you have jumping from sort of place to place and character to character where they're not necessarily um, immediately related and they can be brought together through a film's narration. Um, and in your dreams, you connect all sorts of things together, right? You sort of tie this interesting web of things together. It's your mind drawing all these new connections in this imaginative way that helps you explore other possibilities. It makes your mind more flexible when you're dreaming. Um, it kind of opens you up in a sense. And then this, we use our dreams, I'm sure like when you've gone through a tumultuous time or people right now have been talking about having a lot of weird dreams. And that's partly because a lot of our emotional processing happens when we are asleep, right? Our subconscious kind of comes alive. Um, the things that have, we've been pressing down throughout the day kind of resurface and we subconsciously explore them and work through these. And the same thing happens with a film, right? If we're talking about film as this way to project our desire, project our fears, project taboos and repression onto the screen, we sort of work through them by viewing them in, um, in cinema. So we get to reframe the way we're thinking about something. We get to reframe um, our relation to something by turning it into a dream or turning it into a movie. And in this way, it's like letting us address the thing that maybe we don't want to address directly. A lot of times with dreams, it's not something we want to look straight forward at. It's not something we're ready to confront. And so we only dream about it. And in cinema, the same can be true. I mean, war movies are very, very popular. Violent movies are very, very popular. And I'm guessing not many people would want to actually experience that. Um, so there's something about... Um, addressing something, but from a distance. So I assigned you to watch this video on In the Mood for Love. And this is to think about why all movies are kind of dreamlike, even when they're shot in a realistic manner. This is a really, really beautiful 2001 movie by the director Wong Kar Wai. And um, you're almost like entering this gorgeous, work of art and you feel this desire between these two characters so intensely they have such intense desire for each other but um because of all these reasons they can't pursue it and so it's a really beautiful movie that helps you to think about how desire gets expressed how fantasy gets expressed in um movies in a way that is similar to how we experience it in our dreams so Susan Langer starts out by talking about the difference between theater and a movie. And um, the background here is this um, scene from Quantum of Solace where we see James Bond walking around a, a, a theatrical performance that's an opera. And um, there's a lot of actually theater scenes within movies where you kind of get this juxtaposition of what a theater is. Um, what a theatrical performance going to play is like and what going to a movie is like, which is what you're experiencing when you're watching it. And so it's important to realize that, you know, even though some of the same aspects come out of plays, like um, in some ways a screenplay is an adaptation of 
what we used to have, which is plays and theater, that it becomes very different when you introduce this camera. In particular, it becomes very different when you introduce a moving camera, something that can move around the space. Because in a theater, the audience stays put. So the view and what you're seeing stays put. So in a staged performance, actors move around and they are facing you in very particular ways and you're at a certain distance from them always. And so there's something kind of static about your relationship to the stage actor that always remains the same. Now, when you have a movie actor, right, the camera can be brought in for a close-in and it can switch. And they'll do the same um, line over and over and over and then we set up the camera and shoot it from a different direction. They'll do the same scene many times. In fact, the director Kubrick was famous for taking like 150, 200 shots of the same exact scene, making the actress or actor do it over and over and over again until he felt like he got the perfect shot out of it. And so there's a way that acting for a, a camera is very different than acting for an audience. This is something I feel a lot as I am recording these video lectures. It's very weird to talk to the camera and not to talk to you, not to be in front of you in the classroom. So it's very different to kind of have this um, relationship between the actor and the audience through the camera and it mediated through the camera. It completely changes how you act and how the story unfolds and how you create um, a movie in contrast to creating a play. And one of the things that Langer really points out is she says that, you know, this is an art form and she calls it a new art form because she's writing in 1950. So it hasn't, there haven't been films for that long, only 30 years, right? So she says one of the most striking characteristics of this new art is that it seems to be omnivorous right? Omnivorous as in it eats everything. She says it can assimilate the most diverse materials and turn them into elements of its own. And if you study the history of um, film, this is really fascinating because there's all sorts of things that had to be invented, like the montage, right? Where you have a bunch of clips of something happening that tells a story that's happening over a period of time where you're seeing kind of a thing like Rocky movies are famous for their montages where you see Rocky working out in all these ways and getting stronger and working hard. Um, so things like Technicolor, when they added color, people thought this wasn't gonna be as good as black and white. Even when movies went from being silent movies to being speaking movies, people were really concerned that this had destroyed the art form, that movies would never be the same, it wouldn't be the same art form anymore. And if you wanna see a really funny musical about the change from silent movies to talkies, um, Singing in the Rain is really funny. It's a musical, but it's highly amusing. Um, in other ways, it's very clever. And um, this scene I'm showing you here, this is Lena Lamont, who's one of the most famous, in the movie, she's supposed to be one of the most famous silent actresses of all time. And um, then they turn into, they have to convert all these movies into talking movies. And so she has to be in a movie where you hear her voice. And suddenly she becomes the worst actress because she's used to pantomiming and doing all sorts of exaggerated motions. But when she talks, she has a really annoying voice. And so they can't figure out what to do with her because she's one of the most famous actresses. You know, she packs theaters for people to see her, but she can't really convert herself into this new art form. Um, so there's constantly novelty. Every time something gets invented, um, whether it's CGI or um, some other sort of technique, I even remember the, the move from film to digital um, and the sort of color correction that happens when people shoot things in digital film. People have always been concerned that this will like ruin the art form. But Langer points out that actually, you know, as like when you first see it or when it gets produced a lot in a cheap way, the new technique might not be good, but um, the sort of bad rubbish fades into the distance as people get better and better at the technique and learn how to use it. And so a lot of um, what makes film so interesting is it's constantly being reinvented as an art form. It's constantly having new techniques um, that we see and we get to see this sort of rawness of it when it's new and then we see it worked and refined into something more interesting. So she also talks about film creating a virtual history. And this is how she starts to relate it to a dream. Dreams give us this sort of virtual history, this 
a way of creating a narrative and a past um, and a timeline, um, a sort of narrative that isn't real, it's virtual. And so she says that cinema is a dream mode. She says it's the appearance of a dream, a, con a unified, continually passing significant apparition. So that's how she's thinking of dream, is it's um, something that's unified, continually moving and changing, and it's significant, but it's an apparition, it's a vision, it's, um, it's not real. So she says like a dream, it enthralls and commingles all the senses. So I'm showing you this um, particular image from Mulholland Drive by David Lynch, because David Lynch is one of um, the major directors that sort of um, has an established surreal dreamlike quality to his um, movies and his television shows. If you've seen Twin Peaks, if you've seen any of his movies, um, you can tell he's got this very surreal style. And Mulholland Drive, the tagline for it is a love story in the city of dreams. And it's constantly playing with a sort of dream logic. There's a repetition of objects. There's a lot of doubling. There's a lot of making one character look like another character and switching sort of storylines and um, connections between things that don't seem connected. So Lynch really thinks in this way as a director. This is his sort of technique is to play with the way dreams work and turn that into a sort of cinematic style. And Langer says that when she says that film is like a dream, she doesn't mean that it's copying dreams. She doesn't mean that when you go into the theater, it's like you're in a daydream. And it's in the same sense that if you read a book, it's kind of like memory, right? It's almost as if you're reading a character or some sort of narrator's memory of an event. However, it doesn't make you confusing yourself for remembering that, right? You have this sort of different relation to memory, even though the book is like memory. And so in the same way, she's not saying that film is just like dreaming. She's saying that there's a sort of mode of appearance where dreams and cinema have these similar qualities. They're alike. There's something analogous there that is interesting and worth exploring. So she says, cinema is like dream in the mode of its presentation. It creates a virtual present. Um, it creates a virtual present in order of direct apparition. That is the mode of dream. And this is a um, scene from Spellbound, a dream scene that was designed by Salvador Dali, and I highly recommend watching this on YouTube. It's very interesting. So with dreams and cinema, one of the things Langer points out is that the dreamer is at the center. So when you're dreaming, you might move all over the place. You might make all these weird connections. You might your dream doesn't necessarily have a linear narrative to it where it moves from the past to present to future. It might move all over the place and you can transport yourself magically to different places. Um, in my dreams, I've even become different people at different times. Um, it's weird. I'm not always myself in my dreams. But no matter what, I'm always viewing it, right? I'm always a part of it. I'm always the center of it. I'm always observing whatever is happening in this dream. And the same thing is true with uh, film. She says, places shift. Persons act and speak or change or fade. Facts emerge, situations grow, objects come into view with strange importance, ordinary things infinitely valuable or horrible. And they may be superseded by others that are related to them essentially by feeling, not by natural proximity. But the dreamer is always there. His relation is, so to speak, equidistant from all events. Right, so you are kind of, when you're watching a movie, it's in a way you as the audience member become the center of this and the movie becomes your dream and you're taking in all the things right um even if the movie is moving locations switching between characters switching between um perspectives of characters over time or making all sorts of transformations you are still there observing it piecing it together you're the center that ties it all together so the scene I was just showing you is part of a dream sequence from The Big Lebowski. Um, and this is a great dream sequence because he's piecing something together. Um, it's a great movie. I highly recommend it. Very funny. Um, it, it, I think it has the highest number of F-bombs in it, though. So if you're offended by bad language, maybe don't watch this movie. But um, what we're seeing is 
this character is sort of piecing together all the people he's met, all the problems he has, all the things he loves into this really funny dream sequence. And when he wakes up, he's like made a big connection because his mind was connecting all these things together and bringing it all together. And there's this sort of way that everything gets brought together in a dream and everything gets brought together in a movie, right? There's something about drawing these connections into a center. So the thing that Langer points out is you are the dreamer, right? When you're watching the movie, that's the connection she's trying to make. The camera is not the dreamer. And when we are dreaming, we're kind of usually the agents in the dream. And so the camera is not in the picture. It's not a part of the action. It is more like a mind's eye. That's sort of how she's thinking about it. And so there's this relationship between the camera and what's being presented that is sort of like, if we think about a dream, it's like our mind projecting something, our mind's eye creating this sort of fantasy that we immerse ourselves in. Dreams and um, play, uh, dreams play with space in the same way that film plays with space. So this is another connection she talks about. She says that dream events are spatial, often intensely concerned with space, intervals, endless roads, bottomless canyons, things too high, too near, too far. Right. I'm sure you've experienced this, right? You have a dream where you're running really hard and you can't get anywhere or where something's really steep or really deep or you're lost in a big space and you feel tiny or you're falling endlessly through space, right? Dreams are very spatial. So she says, but they're not really oriented in any total space. Right? The space itself doesn't necessarily make sense. And the same thing is true about movies. It's really interesting if you ever watch um, the making of a movie and you see characters um, and the way cameras are set up to make the space look a particular way. But if you're further back than the camera, the space just looks ridiculous and doesn't make sense. So there's a way that the, the sort of what is happening in the space of the dream and what is happening in the space of what's being filmed in the camera and that mind's eye view, the camera view, um, that's where the significance of that space is. There's not like an idea of an extended world in space because if you pull back from it, it makes no sense. So the same is true of the movie moving picture and distinguishes it. Despite its visual character from plastic art, its space comes and goes. It is always a secondary illusion. Right? So the space is so constructed within a movie and it's so constructed within our dreams. And even when we watch a movie, it's so constructed within a particular space, it's framed very carefully. And um, the sort of video on In the Mood for Love talks about framing, because this is a very common technique in um, Japanese movies. Akira um, Kurosawa used this all the time, frames within frames. And it reminds you of your, um, either the frame of a movie screen or the frame of your television screen. I'm making a screen here too. And also dreams and movies play with time. So she says the dreamed reality of the screen can move forward and backwards because it is really an eternal and ubiquitous virtual present, right? So we can move through time in all these different ways in movies. There's lots of non-linear narrative um, storytelling devices that are used where you have flashbacks, you have um, sort of projections into the future. Um, these are used a lot. When you're watching drama on a, stage like a theatrical performance you don't have the same sense sometimes some plays do have sort of flashbacks or non-linear storytelling but normally there's this sort of impetus towards the ending there's this sort of future there's this idea of watching the action unfold in a linear way where you have a beginning middle and end when you're watching a play and with um movies instead time moves much more in different directions so she says the dream mode is an endless now in the same way, when we're watching a movie, we're always in the now. And Memento really played with the idea of how to use time in movies in a different way. Christopher Nolan told a story backwards. And so what he did was he started um, kind of at the end of the movie. And the reason why is there's a character who has short-term memory loss. He can't remember anything. Um, after suffering, some, I think, a head injury. So he has to take Polaroids and he tattoos his body to give him some sort of sense of what's happening. And he's trying to find his wife's murderer and seek revenge. And so you get these scenes where they have to move forward, right, um, in some sense. But you'll get a scene and then um, the next scene will be 
um, what came like before that scene. And so you're piecing this together in a very different direction. And it's a really interesting, given the particular aspect, right? You have someone trying to solve a murder, trying to find someone. And we are piecing together the story as we're watching him. We're trying to make sense of it in this reverse way. And it's following the same train of thought of deductive reasoning. We're trying to get from a conclusion back to it or inductive. Yeah, it's more like inductive reasoning. So, um, so Christopher Nolan is using film and how it plays with time to tell the story. So um, there's a lot of aspects of movies that play with dreams very explicitly and implicitly. And she quotes this um, director, Sergei Einstein, who believed that the beholder of a film was somewhat specially called on to use his imagination to create his own experience of the story. So this is another way that the sort of imagination we use during a film is very similar to dreaming. Even though we're watching something being told to us, we have to make the connections, right? So directors give us clues, right? They might show us, oh, someone dropped their car keys when they got out of their um, car and it's in a dark parking lot and I'm watching a horror movie. So you're like, oh, someone's going to pop out and they're not going to be able to get their keys. So they can't get into their house. So something bad's going to happen, right? So in a lot of movies, you're given all these visual cues or auditory cues or um, these sort of structures that are helping you piece things together. So you follow it, but you're doing that. And in a way, you're sort of like the detective following along with the clues the director is giving you. And in a way, that's what's happening in a dream, right? It's kind of unfolding around you and you're making sense of the dream and processing it as you go through it. You have to use your imagination in the dream. You have to use your imagination when you're watching a film. And so he says, here we have, I think, an indication of the powerful illusion the film makes not of things going on, but of the dimension in which they go on. Right? So it's not about just what's happening, it's about how are we relating to ha what's happening? What is the dimension? And you know, with some movies, two people can watch it and get very different experiences out of it. So you see that there's an imaginative space, which is where the movie is kind of located, not just what's happening directly on the screen. So um, a virtual creative imagination, for it seems one's own creation, direct visionary experience, a dreamed reality. Right, so some movies are pretty straightforward and they tell you exactly what's going on and they don't really leave anything open to interpretation. But a lot of movies are trying to get you to piece things together. Um, and that's why twists are so interesting in movies because you think you're following along and you've got it and then the director plays a trick on you and twists it. And you had an expectation and it didn't get fulfilled, it got flipped around. And so that shows that you're investing your imagination into the plot. It's not just the plot that's happening, it's the plot you're building. And that's how movies play with us, is we need to use our imagination to view them. So if you wanna think more about movies and film, um, I highly recommend Waking Life. It is a super philosophical movie. There's actually multiple interviews with philosophers within it. It's shot in this, it's animated in a rotoscoping technique where um, it was actually filmed and then they animate over the filmed people, the sort of live filmed people, and it creates this very dreamlike quality. And throughout it, you're trying to figure out, are you in a dream? Is this character dead? What's happening? And there's this quote that it's very, a lot of the conversations have to do with dreams and this idea that dream is destiny. And then also The Perfect's Guide to Cinema um, is a really great documentary. It stars uh, Joe Zizek. Uh, Zizek is kind of a popular philosopher. Um, he's kind of like a pop culture critic in some ways. He also writes on Hegel and Marx um, and Lacan. Uh, but he makes these documentaries and they put him in the movies that he's talking about. So this is him and the birds. And he gives um, these sort of like philosophical Lacanian Marxist readings of movies um, and all sorts of popular movies like Hitchcock movies, The Birds, The Matrix, the Alien franchise. He's really into that. Um, so, and there's also the Pervert's Guide to um, Ideology, which also explores film as well. So these are interesting ways you can think about the connection between film and uh, philosophy, but also it focuses on the idea that film really is about fantasy. It really is about dreaming and projecting our dreams onto the screen. Thank you so much. I'm looking very much forward to what you have to say on the discussion board this week.